Today is Thursday, June 6, 2019. Coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, today is 75th anniversary of D-Day. You probably wouldn't know that because you see many black soldiers, and so that's why we have a black show. We'll be talking with retired General Kip Ward, also the author of a book on black soldiers and D-Day. See, that's what you, we do here. We talk about black people. All right, also, Beto O'Rourke will be joining me. I had an interview with him earlier today. We were talking about a variety of issues, including what he is going to do for education, HBCUs, his thoughts on charter schools, and what will he be say to white folks about white fear? Yep, I don't want to miss that conversation. Black youth suicide between the ages of 5 and 12 has surpassed that of white children. What is going on? We'll talk to an expert. Plus, the editor of The Atlantic says writers who can write really, really wrong, long features are almost exclusively white males. I have something to say about that. And Central Park 5 prosecutor Linda Fairstein loses her Woman of the Year award from Glamour. It's about damn time. And guess what? More crazy ass white women. Yes, we have video. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's going. There are more people running for president on the Democratic side than there are weigh-ins. Yeah, say it ain't so. One of the folks is Beto O'Rourke, of course. So he ran for the United States Senate, lost to Senator Ted Cruz, got within two and a half points of upsetting him. Uh, that has caused a lot of his supporters to say he can make a real run for the presidency. Well, earlier this morning, he and I t had a conversation. We talked about a variety of things, including his plan to register more than 50 million voters and make sure that an additional 35 million folks can vote in 2024. Here's our conversation. Well, first off, uh, welcome to Roland Martin Unfiltered, uh, Congressman Beto O'Rourke. Uh, how are things in your world? Things are great. I'm in Atlanta. We just had a voting rights forum last night. I'm going to get a chance to, to meet Stacey Abrams today, a little bit later today. I'm lo really looking forward to that on this same subject and then have a chance to, to speak to a group later this evening before moving on to Iowa tomorrow. So grateful to be in Georgia. Now, let's talk about that particular issue. Uh, you've unveiled uh, your voting rights uh, platform, your issue uh, that you have laid out. This is something that uh, that I have been obviously focused on for a number of years. The reality is that <clears throat> on the Republican side, there's there's this constant focus uh, to suppress the vote all across the country, whether we're talking about Georgia, whether we're talking about uh, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, especially in North Carolina. Uh, and, and, and I say that this is, without a doubt, uh, the plan and strategy of the National Republican Party because they do not want to see black folks, young folks vote. They want to be able to shrink the population in order uh, to maintain power. That's absolutely right. And I would add my, my home state of Texas to that list. Yeah, for... Well, first of all, I'm also a native of Texan, so you're right. Texas is yeah. as well. Yeah, we ranked 50th in voter turnout before 2018, and that was because of <clears throat> The taxes, tactics that you just described, the state legislature literally drew people out of congressional districts based on their race or ethnicity. The courts found that to be the case in 2017. In Texas, you can use your license to carry a firearm to prove who you are at the ballot box, but you cannot use your student ID at Prairie View A&M or the El Paso Community College to prove who you are at the ballot box. But we saw a lot of people in 2018 transcend those barriers. And in fact, young voter turnout in early voting was up 500 uh, percent. You had one of the greatest levels of turnouts in a midterm election year in the history of the state of Texas. So, so there's a way to overcome this through people's organization and willingness to volunteer and get after it. But, but you've got to institutionalize that. And so our plan calls for bringing in 50 million new voters 
over the next four years, uh, bringing 35 million new people to the polls who not just registered but are actually voting over that same time period, and then removing the barriers to voting. So stopping the, the purges of voter rolls that we've seen in those states that you've just described, perhaps most notably here in, in Georgia, uh, making sure that there are no more discriminatory voter ID laws or racial gerrymandering, and then guaranteeing the sanctity of the ballot box, having paper ballots and or paper receipts, having full audits of all the elections that take place, and then making sure that we get big money out of our politics and have people just respond to other people, not PACs, not corporations, not special interests. If, if we do all of that within uh, the frame of a new Voting Rights Act, then this democracy is going to fully function, and we're going to be able to meet those big challenges, whether it's immigration or economic inclusion, health care or confronting climate before it's too late. But how, how do you speak to—and this, this is the space where I think it is um, the missing link. How do you speak to white voters to get them to understand that? And, and let me unpack that. A couple of years ago, I was at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation uh, annual legislative conference, and it was all the civil rights leaders, it was Secretary of State of uh, the state of California. And, and I said, uh, look, I said in, in 2016, that was a clerk in Wisconsin who specifically said she moved a voting location off of a college campus because too many young folks were voting and she moved it to a far out place with a small parking lot. Uh, what took place in North Carolina, removing those voting locations off of those campuses. Wisconsin, uh, some 200,000 people were affected by that voter ID law. Even though the Obama administration, uh, they approved it, uh, their voter ID law in terms of the, uh, the, the DOJ, uh, federal judge had to pull in Governor Scott Walker and say, why y'all foot dragging on these voter IDs? And I think every time we talk about voting, uh, in many ways, we're talking about African Americans, Voting Rights Act, uh, and preclearance, but young white voters, uh, older voters as well, uh, are being targeted. And, and, and when I said to civil rights groups, you've got to tell white Americans, look, this ain't a black thing. Your voting rights are also being impacted. And I think that's, that's, that's also a disconnect there. Absolutely. I, I think you just made the case, and, and I think we could continue by saying it's not just um, the elections that are compromised. It is the policies that follow. So if Stacey Abrams were the governor of Georgia, you would have no new anti-choice legislation being signed that restricts a woman's ability to make her own decisions about her own body. Now, that affects women of color, but it also affects white women in this state. You might find some common cause in the policies that follow fraudulent elections like the one that was held in Georgia. Or you mentioned North Carolina, where um, yeah, I think fraud is the right word to use in a congressional district where the will of the voters was subverted. And thankfully, they're going to redo that election. I think the Democrats going to win if there is a, a level playing field. So I think you're absolutely right to, to say that we've got to find the common cause that makes this not just an issue important to communities of color, but an issue to, to everyone in America. Because anything that any one of us wants to be able to achieve will only be possible if everyone is brought in to this democracy. And we're beginning to see um, some good changes in, in Georgia, as you probably know. Uh, there's the new Georgia project, which is going to ensure that we get those registrations and folks actually out to the polls in Texas, the Texas Organizing Project. So really from the grassroots, even before you have a new Voting Rights Act, people are taking matters into their own hands and making sure that everyone gets out to the polls. Um, let's talk about uh, another critical issue, and that is, again, uh, for you, the state of your campaign. Uh, you've been in it for a couple of months now. Um, uh, the, uh, the pundits say you're lagging in the polls. H how do, with so many people in this, in this race, how do you uh, get traction? Uh, how do you uh, build that where people then are saying, hey, he has a legitimate shot at this? Or, because you hear people say, you know what? He should have ran for U.S. Senate. He should have stayed in Texas, built folks there, targeted John, John Cornyn. What do you have to do to gain traction in a field with 23, 24 candidates? You know, at its best, this race is going to be a competition of ideas. And so this bold proposal that we released yesterday on voting rights and making sure that more people are brought into our democracy, I hope helps to distinguish us. 
We've also released bold plans on climate change, bold plans on immigration reform. We've talked very passionately about a criminal justice system where we need to reform it by making sure that not only do we end the war on drugs, not only do we do away with for-profit prisons, not only do we end cash bail and expunge the arrest records of those arrested for possession of a substance that's legal in more than half the states in the country right now, but that we go well beyond that and confront the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and segregation and suppression that is alive and well in every part of American life today. But I think there are some personal things that might also distinguish me as well. Coming from the U.S.-Mexico border, a community that doesn't just tolerate our differences but embraces them, one of the safest places in the United States of America today in El Paso is safe, not despite, but because we are a city of immigrants. And in this race that we ran last year in Texas, one of the reddest states in America, we went to every single county and brought people in. It didn't matter how rural, how small, how red. We were going to show up with the courage of our convictions, talking about the most important issues, but then bringing you in to this process. And we also didn't take the big blue places for granted either. We showed up there as well and included people in the outcomes of that election. And though I didn't win at the end of the day, we got close. We won more votes than any Democrat had in the history of the state of Texas. Won independence for the first time in decades, brought Republicans along as well. And as you know, we now have two new members of Congress in part as a result, both Democrats replacing Republicans, 17 African-American women elected to judicial positions in Harris County. So we were able to help fix our democracy in Texas and bring more people in. I think that's the only way that you beat Trump in 2020. It's the only way that you bring this country back together again in 2021. Uh, one of the areas that uh, is also critically important that I talk about a lot deals with economics, uh, and that is you've got 2.6 million black-owned businesses in America. 2.5 million of those only have one employee. Uh, when we had uh, 1.9 million black-owned businesses several years ago, they were doing an average revenue of about $110,000 a year. Today, here we have 700,000 more black-owned businesses, and they're only doing an average revenue of $54,000 a year. Uh, and so what will you do to deal with that? Because uh, having black businesses not being able to grow, not being able uh, to have capital, not being able to build capacity has a direct impact on the economic uh, future of African-Americans, especially when you talk about wealth creation. I want to double the amount of money that we have in community finance institutions to get capital into the community so the businesses that you just described can expand and grow, hire, invest in new equipment and technologies, and expand their customer base. I want to make sure that the federal government, through the billions of dollars in procurement decisions that it makes, favors true small businesses and helps specifically minority-owned businesses to expand. One of the legacies that I just described, uh, that I alluded to in, in terms of slavery and segregation and redlining, is the fact that you've got 10 times the wealth in white America than you do in black America. And this is going to exist and persist and be exacerbated unless you have structural changes in how the government purchases and how capital gets out into community. So those two structural changes in terms of community lending, doubling the amount that we get out there, and procurement decisions from the federal government. And if you match that with a, a new deduction for small business owners mm -hmm. in the tax code, especially these small businesses that you're talking about, I think you begin to get uh, closer to parity, or at least you get people on the path to be able to pursue something closer to parity going forward. Th those are three concrete steps that we can take. Uh, let's also uh, so, so stay on that because when we talk about, again, uh, fostering uh, job growth uh, and, and job development, when you talk about those dollars, one of the biggest uh, complaints that I've heard from mayors for years is that uh, you've had plans in the past where they said, fine, we'll take the money and then we'll send it to states. Uh, whereas mayors said, hey, wait a minute, we've had better uh, better uh, outcomes uh, when it comes to uh, DBA participation, when it comes to uh, African-American businesses. And so I think also a big issue is whoever is president saying, hey, let's bypass these governors uh, and let's say, how do we target money directly to states, excuse me, to cities, uh, city programs where African-Americans have done a lot better than statewide programs. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the real innovation is happening at the city level right now. I was just in Columbia, South Carolina, visiting with Mayor Benjamin. He was telling me about the power of these community development block grants. He, he was able to use that small federal investment and match it, I think, nine to one and build affordable housing in the city center of Columbia, housing that University of South Carolina students can afford, housing that others who might have otherwise been pushed out of their neighborhoods could afford because he made developer investment and the zoning that was necessary conditional on affordability. So, so here you have a mayor who's tackling the crisis in housing affordability in the United States, and that's happening not at the state or the federal level, that's happening at the local level. So let's find uh, those most innovative mayors and city councils and let's invest in them. Uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, education is uh, obviously another critically important issue. Uh, what is your specific plan uh, for the nation's historically black colleges and universities? Uh, obviously, in Texas, uh, you have institutions that are private. Uh, you have Houston Tillerson in Austin. Uh, you also have Wiley College, and you have uh, you know Paul Quinn there in the Dallas area. And then, of course, your larger ones, TSU in Houston, as well as Prairie View, but also across the country. What is your plan for HBCUs? I was just fortunate enough to be able to give the commencement at Paul Quinn College last month. And one of the things that I learned uh, from my visits to Paul Quinn is it is the first urban work college in the United States of America. They've been able to reduce the, the cost of tuition through this program. They've been able to guarantee more of their students' jobs right after graduation. And the level of indebtedness is much lower than it was, say, 10 years ago at Paul Quinn College. But we know that HBCUs, because of smaller endowment sizes, have a much larger challenge in being able to make college affordable and prevent students from graduating with thirty, forty, sixty thousand dollars dollars $60,000 in student loan debt. So a greater investment from the federal government in these HBCUs is absolutely critical. Any plan to make sure that we have free community college, that we do a better job of elevating unions and access to apprenticeships must be combined with an investment in, in HBCUs and then the ability to pay down debt affordably. So let's lower the interest rates and let's absolutely expand the public service loan forgiveness program. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to work at the VA, uh, teach school, um, invest part of your life in public service, I wanna wipe clean the student loan debt that you carry so that you can focus on your career, your life and serving others. Uh, let's talk about, uh, uh, we talk about primary and secondary education. I, I am, I went to Magnus Schools in Houston, uh, Jack Hayes High School, Magnus School of Communications. Uh, I am a huge supporter of charter schools uh, because for me, my, my belief, I believe in every form of education if it works for the children. And so when it comes to uh, charter schools, which is also an opportunity for African Americans to control schools, run the schools, control the curriculum, control the economics, uh, what is your stance uh, on uh, public charter schools? So I think there's a role for, for charter schools for some of the reasons that you just described. Um, but I think that there, there's not going to be an opportunity to, to charter our way through right. all the challenges or opportunities that we have. There's also some really extraordinary public schools in, in the city in which you were educated. We were visiting Cashmere Gardens after Harvey. And one of the things that the, the president of the Neighborhood Association told me is that um, we, were, we were hit by a storm long before Harvey. And he talked about just lack of social, uh, educational services, um, the ability to get a, a healthy meal, uh, kind of a food desert in that area. And we were passing Kashmir Elementary, and I said, well, this has got to be a poor-performing school. And he said, actually, this, this is really the bright spot in, in our community. It's a, it's a complete school, so not only do you have free and reduced breakfast and lunch, but you have primary and mental health care services at that school, which many kids are unable for whatever reason, perhaps because Texas failed to expand Medicaid, unable to access but they're able to access them there at that school, world-class public school educators, instructors, and teachers. So I think investing in them, making sure that pre-K is universal across this country, that teachers can focus on just one job because they don't have to work two or three as they do throughout Texas and, and too many states in this country right now, that's gonna necessitate greater federal investment in programs like the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, 
Title I funding, make sure that those are laboratories for innovation as well. So um, I, I think that, that public education can be foundational to our larger economic success, but we've got to make it a, a primary focus, and right now it is not. Uh, well, I got, we know we've got a couple of minutes left, and so when we, when we talk about uh, also how, how we move forward, I said this to Senator Bernie Sanders, and I've said this to every other, every other uh, uh, white Democrat. I believe that what we're seeing with Donald Trump is we're operating in this age of white fear, that we have individuals who understand the demographic changes in this country. How do you directly, how do you directly talk to white voters to get them to understand that this whole we keep we keep hearing economic anxiety. I think white Democrats have to look white voters in the eye and say, "You are being played on racial politics and the fear of the changes in the country." And I think it has to be explicit. It has to be clear. And also, I think uh, uh, white Democrats have to also go to the reddest places in the country and look at white voters in the eye and say, your health care sucks, your economics suck, and guess what? You're being played because you're being played on racial fears. Uh, are you willing to do that, to look white voters in the eye and say, look, stop blaming another ethnicity for what's going on here. The America is changing. You have, to, you have to accept the reality of what's going on. Yes, the answer is yes, and, and that's what I did across Texas in 2017 and 2018. It's what I've been doing in this presidential campaign, going to southwest Iowa, for example, and listening to and talking with farmers who are really bearing the brunt of this president's trade policies. I mean, the soybeans, the corn that they're growing can no longer find markets in Asia. If he imposes these tariffs on Mexico, they'll no longer be able to sell there. They're already underwater in debt. They're already underwater from the floods from the Missouri River. This, this president is absolutely punishing them and distracting them, or at least trying to at the same time, by trying to make them scared of Mexicans, who he calls rapists and criminals, or Muslims, who he wants to ban from this country, or calling Klansmen or white supremacists or neo-Nazis very fine people. And I remind folks that this doesn't just offend our sensibilities. This leads to change practices in our country. Hate crimes in America, up three years in counting in a row. Uh, you had the, the mosque in Victoria, Texas, burned to the ground on the day that he signed his Muslim travel ban. You don't put kids in cages until you first describe them as animals or an infestation. So yes, we, we talk about that in the places you might expect us to, but we talk about those things in the places you'd least expect us to in front of all white audiences in rural parts of America. It's the only way that we're going to confront this challenge together and be able to overcome it. Uh, and it's going to take all of us. And so, yeah, I, I want to make sure that we take that message everywhere in this country. All right. Better O'Rourke, I uh, appreciate you joining us. Joining me and Roland Martin Unfiltered. Thanks so much. Thank you. Very grateful. All right, folks, let's uh, have a conversation about uh, Beto O'Rourke with our panel. Joining me right now is, of course, uh, from left to right, Adisha Cross, political commentator, Sinclair Group, uh, Dr. Greg Carr, chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University, and Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president emerita Bennett College. And so, Amisha, I'll start with you. Um, the, the, he's, he's qualified for the debate. Um, there, were, there were a number of things that Democrats said to qualify. Uh, but the reality is, with, with all of the hype, all of the attention, I remember I remember in 2018, I was at different places, and there was some young black kids. They were like, oh, he, 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 he must run for president. He's the only one who can win. And I kept saying, but he lost. <laughs> and that was it. And, and it was this. And again, and so, so he comes out, Vanity Fair cover. All of this coverage, and then Peter's out. There are 24 candidates. Um, and the reality is, he's not in the top Ten. five, top seven, top eight. Um, Chuck Schumer's sitting there going, why aren't you running for the United States Senate? Do you believe that he should be running for president or he should, he should have stayed in Texas and run against Senator John Cornyn for that seat next year? He definitely shouldn't be running for president. I think that he was oversaturated um, during during the his Senate run last go round, but he definitely you know came into this with a lot more esteem in himself than he probably should have had. Mm -hmm. Anyone who says I was born for this 
is it, it should raise <laughs> our level of sensibilities. But also, I think that there was an air of white male privilege in a lot of his conversation. And I think that that's coming back to bite him, not only in terms of losing American, um, news, losing American support, but also not really being able to separate himself and his ideology from some of the other candidates. Right now, in a lot of his policy proposals, they look exactly like the other, or at least the top 15 candidates in the race. Joseph, Joseph Pinar, Republican strategist, uh, joins us via Skype. Joseph, it was really interesting because I had been sparring with Beto supporters all day long. They've been arguing with me about Texas, saying I have no clue about Texas politics. I even had one dude from Albany, New York, who was trying to tell me about Texas politics, and I said, um, out of the two of us, which one of us actually took seventh grade Texas history? <laughs> I did, because I'm from there. And, and they kept talking about how he came close. And, and, and they got really mad at me because I said, let me be clear, coming close isn't winning. Winning is winning, losing is losing. And they kept talking about how Beto's, Beto is the only person who can put Texas in play. And I had to remind them that, no, 2000, Al Gore ran for president, was the former U.S. senator from Tennessee, lost his home state. Had Al Gore won his home state, he didn't need Florida. If Al Gore had just won Tennessee, he would have been president. And so it's really interesting just listening to them go back and forth. And I kept saying, yes, you're right. The, the enthusiasm, all the folks who, who, who were out there. But he was also running against the one Republican who y'all hate, Ted Cruz. Yeah, I mean, I, I think realistically that if you look at, you know, what, what has transpired here with Beto, you have to talk about two different things. You have to talk about the fact that, number one, he's running for his own political future. I think the reality is, I think he's smart enough to know that Texas is probably not going to go blue in a 2020 presidential election. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think that from a personal standpoint, it was probably a fool's errand for him to try to run uh, statewide. I think long term, I think that how does he maintain his aura, how did he make sure that he has a future? I think that he made a determination that the best thing for him to do was to go out there, run for president, put himself in this kind of air of superiority where he could potentially be an attractive vice presidential choice or it might be um, the dog that catches the car uh, in such a field and possibly find a way to win the nomination. Hold so tight one second, all... Joseph. Hold on. I'm getting a lot of feedback. I'm getting a lot of feedback. If my folks, can y'all find out? If there are other people who are talking in the room, or is that our feedback coming through? Uh, and so let me know. Y'all can fix that. I appreciate it. One Greg Carr. Uh, again, this is an extremely crowded field, and you have to stand out. And if you look at where we are right now, Vice President Joe Biden comes out. He's a front runner. Bernie Sanders, he's lagging behind. Look at all the media fawning coverage of uh, Pete uh, Buttigieg. He's there. But you look at the policy proposals being thrown out by seeing Elizabeth Warren. She's gaining traction. The two largest viewership of town halls on CNN and MSNBC this year have been Senator Kamala Harris, second to only the Bernie Sanders town hall uh, on Fox News. Uh, and so we, we, when you look at, look at that, people are very surprised and shocked that uh, Beto O'Rourke is so far down compared to the amount of tension, uh, tension and coverage uh, and enthusiasm that he got. Well, yeah, I'd have to disagree with Joseph uh, when he said that, you know, he was a fool's errand for O'Rourke to run against statewide. I, I, I would have to agree with what you've articulated, your sensibility in terms of if he had stayed in Texas and run against Cornyn, we see Cornyn now coming out against Trump on this question of these, uh, these tariffs against Mexico. Why? Because Cornyn is scared now. T Texas isn't the Texas that when John Cornyn entered the, the federal legislature. And, you know, and I understand O'Rourke is young, he has some talent, but... His namesake, not Beto, but Robert Francis O'Rourke, as in Robert Francis Kennedy, by that age, he had been Attorney General of the United States, he had been mm -hmm. in the United States Senate, he had run a presidential campaign, his brother, John Kennedy's campaign. Beto O'Rourke is a great example, and Pete Buttigieg, as far as I'm concerned, of real affirmative action. No, You're a white is... man who decides you're just going to run for president. Dude, but if you wanted to really advance that agenda, which a lot of that came from H.R. 1, the, voter, the voting rights bill mm -hmm. that the federal legislature passed, the Congress actually, you know, advanced then you would stay at home in Texas and help the Democratic Party flip Texas. That's your job, unless it's all about ego. But you know, this was a, just a minute. The, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'll, I'll come to you. So go ahead. Yeah. This is simmering in white privilege. This is what the, mm -hmm. he and Buttigieg are yeah. simmering in white privilege. They are 
failed? Can they, Buttigieg, what, 120,000? Well, first of all, hold on, first of all, he's not a fail. He actually was, he actually was elected. He, he was did. mayor <laughs> of South Bend. <laughs> oh, oh, 120,000 uh, uh, people of, wrote. I know, in the case of Beto O'Rourke, he was a member of Congress. True. Uh, yeah. But but he didn't do anything when he was a member of Congress. What legislation can we put his hat on? What can we say he stood for? I got you. You know, and so this, I mean, you had a great interview with him, but he is not worth two dead flies, in my mind. If he was serious about doing anything, he would stay his behind in Texas and run for Senate, which he could win after the previous uh, enthusiasm for him. But to run for president is like the hubris of these people mm. who just, hubris, who think that they can be president of the United States because they white. I mean, sure, go ahead. So say, in this conversation about him running for Senate in Texas, I think that there's a missing piece here. Castro is actually set up to run against Cornyn. And I think that Castro, to be honest, is a better candidate. I don't think that Beto would have been able to best Castro in any means. Yeah, but here's the problem. That's good He's also running for president. So again, you 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 have you have other one, no, you talking about well, well, no, 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 but but you have like Lottie, Dottie, Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is what I'm saying is you have arguably the two top Democratic candidates to run in Texas who are running for president who are not in uh, the upper the echelon. That's the just the reality. Joseph, I think we fixed the audio there. Um, I, I keep I, I keep hearing this 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 line from uh, Beto supporters and trust that they be coming at him saying that he scares Republicans. The reality is his run against Ted Cruz uh, did get the attention of Republicans. But I also keep reminding people he was also running against the most hated Republican. President George W. Bush did <laughs> fundraisers for Republicans all across the country. He refused to do one for Ted Cruz. And so to me, I think, so. I, and, and I totally understand. And yes, I can look at the numbers, the surge of independence, young voters across the board. But there were Republicans who hated Ted Cruz. I think it, 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 it might be, a, I think if you look, if he ran against Cornyn, you would, I think, have a much better view of whether or not Texas uh, is transitioning away from being a solid red state. And that's, and that's, why, that's why I believe, had he taken the time not run for president, built the infrastructure, kept his team in place, focused on voter, mo voter mobilization in 2019 and geared up for 2020, Democrats could also... Republicans have to have to defend a lot of seats, and so it would be a much better position. Uh, but I just think it's going to be very difficult to put, to get the traction with all of these candidates. And I think if you get down to like September and October, and if he is not around 10, 15 percent, it's going to be a problem. No, I, I think realistically, to look at it I, again, I would tend to agree with the notion that Beto O'Rourke was probably not the best choice to be running for president of the United States. Having said that, I would say if you look at Texas, I would agree that it's no longer a solid red state. You're looking at a situation where you have Harris County, which is literally a, a, a county which is larger than Iowa. I um, mean, it, 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 if it was a state, it would be the 25th largest state in the nation, right? So Texas is very much trending towards blue. But I think mm. somebody like a Julian Castro would have been a much better choice. To run statewide in Texas. I think if you look at it realistically, you're looking at the situation where the Texas situation right now is four, four years from now, right? So, I, being a, if I was giving Beto a, a, a political advice, I would tend to believe and tend to lend myself to the notion that he had no business running statewide because I think he would have been, ended up being a two time loser um, with no political future. So, I think if you're looking at it from a, just a raw political standpoint, yes, maybe it would have been better for the Democratic Party. Had he run statewide, had he continued to register voters, but I think it would have been unrealistic to think that he was actually going to be able to win statewide in this environment. Well, I'll, I'll say I'll say this here. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll say this here. When you look at what's happening uh, in Texas, first of all, first of all, uh, Texas is uh, true. Texas is not trending blue. So let me let, let me let me just unpack that. And again, this is going to hurt. Uh, all the feelings. And again, we're going to sort out the audio issues with Joseph, so he's going to go away for a bit. We'll try to get him back once we sort it all out. It is down, so, so again, and, and this is really for a lot of the Beto people, okay, um, who are into hero worship. They're like, you, you're bashing Beto. I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm trying to explain to you what is reality. 
I am born and raised in Texas, born and raised in Houston. I've worked in Dallas, still own a home there. That was a, first of all, Texas used to be a state that was all blue. Democrats controlled the entire state. Right. Senator John Tower was the first Republican elected statewide in Texas in 1984 since Reconstruction. 1994 was the last time Democrats actually won statewide. That year, George W. Bush beat Ann Richards. But if you actually look at the results from that year, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, the comptroller, they were all the land commissioner. They were all Democrats. Those are the top four out of the top five out of the top six positions. Now, it reached a point where Dallas County flipped all red. John Cruzo, the brother who's now the district attorney in Dallas County, had to run as a Republican to get reelected as a judge because no Democrat could win. Mm. Fast forward about five or six years. It flips. Lu Lupe Valdez, uh, Latino, lesbian, Latina, lesbian, she becomes the sheriff in Dallas County. Cruzo runs as a Democrat. The DA, Democrat. Judicial positions, Democrat. This county flipped. Harris County flipped. Why? Because the Dems focused on what have a straight ticket balloting. Republicans used to dominate straight ticketing. Democrats figured it out. Why do you think they saw results? So what happened in 2017? Republicans in the legislature got rid of straight ticket voting in Texas hmm. because the Democrats figured it out and they took control in Dallas in Harris County, Bear County, which is San Antonio, Travis County, which is Austin. They saw what was going on. The problem in Texas is, though, even with their gains in Dallas County and Harris County, Republicans still control every statewide elected position. And so and all the Beto folks keep tweeting me, and I keep telling y'all, wake the hell up. Oh, it's going to turn blue. When you haven't won a single statewide position in 25 years, there's no such thing as we're about to turn blue. In order for you to turn blue, you got to win one, then two, then three, four, five, six, seven. What does that require? It requires strong candidates with infrastructure, with the ability to motivate, the ability to raise money, which is why you got to have your strong folks also running on the statewide level for U.S. Senate. But see, to the point of our panelists, and this may not be the case with Beto, and you think it is, it's fine. But you look at what, in, the guy who's uh, from Montana. His wife said, we're only going to D.C. if he becomes president. <laughs> they gave no consideration to the United States Senate. Right. But you know why? Because they don't want to be backbenchers. They want the power of the presidency. And yes, Donald Trump has actually changed this whole equation because they hear about now things they can be president. <laughs> but the reality is, oh, but you look at a Senator Kamala Harris, District Attorney, right. Attorney General, United States Senate, now she's running. And so, as we're watching this whole thing, just understand that's the case. I'm going to put a prediction down right now. The first debate is in a, is in a, uh, in a couple of weeks. The second debate is going to be in July. I'm telling y'all right now, it's at least eight of these people ain't going to be around come November. Because you can't get to November and you're polling one, three, four percent, just ain't gonna happen. And so what? what so what is required though? To have candidates who, and guess what? The people who also are running for president could drop out and still run for United States Senate. Hmm. Watch some of these things transpire, and I'm just saying you need to check it out. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I appreciate Bill O'Rourke joining us, uh, and of course there were other candidates who we're gonna be talking to as well. Look forward to having those conversations. And I keep telling y'all, so stop asking me, who's going to win? Nobody knows. Joe Biden, of course, yesterday came out and said he supports the Hyde Amendment, uh, which the, all the Democrats' candidates have been nailing him. Guess what? He could screw up in one of these debates. And let me also give y'all history, those of you who somehow refuse to understand the past. <laughs> 2008, no, 2007, Senator Barack Obama was down 25 points to Hillary Clinton in August of 2007. In October, there was a debate in Iowa. She was asked the question about driver's licenses for undocumented workers. She blew the question. That was the door that cracked open that Obama walked through. That's how he was able to gain traction and then he beat her in Iowa. So please, don't send me any crap right now about a poll showing this, showing who's beating who in Texas, who's leading right now. Folks, 
It's a whole lot that's going to go down between now and the first state that votes and now and the second state. And even when Iowa votes, guess what? Early voting would have already started in California. Hmm. So this is an entire different election. And so let folks debate in June, let them debate in July, and then we'll have a different conversation in August. But right now, I ain't getting excited about nobody. Because, hell, at the rate we going, everybody ain't declared. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Somebody else may run. Wow. So can All you right, just yeah. say bye, Beto? No, bye, no, Beto. no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say bye, Beto, because guess what? Things could change. But the bottom line is, by November, we'll see actually who has sea legs and who's in this thing. All right, going to a break right now. When we come back, we're going to talk about suicide among young African Americans. We'll also talk about white privilege in media. And y'all know I got to show y'all some crazy ass white woman. Oh, yeah, we got a little bit more stuff. Right here, Roller Martin Unfiltered. Back in a moment. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. All right, y'all, for the first time in the history, the rate of suicide by young black children between the ages of 5 and 12 has surpassed that of white children. In addition, according to the Journal of American Medical Association of Pediatrics, black boys are at even greater risk due to factors like racism, depression, and exposure to violence. What is going on when it comes to suicide in black kids? Joining me now is Jan Desper-Peters, Executive Director of the Black Mental Health Alliance. Jan, glad to have you here. So what's going Thank on? Thank you. Even the, um, the um, publication that was put out by the American Medical Association um, realistically states that they don't know. Um, they don't know why. The why is the million dollar question. Is it because mostly white folks are looking at it and they have not talked to black people? Yeah, well, that. <laughs> <laughs> See, we, 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 this show's right. called Unfiltered Jazz. Right. We just okay. cut right to just the chase. Right, right, this ain't MSNBC. Okay. Okay. Right. We don't consider the feelings of white folks. Don't worry about it. Okay. Right. <laughs> feelings of white folks? What that? Right, right, right. I right. mean, and and who's also doing the research? Who's doing the research to, sh to look at these um, young black children? Um, between the ages of 5 and 12, mm. um, the first time in 10 years in, in, in them looking at this research and seeing that um, the, the rates are double that of white children between the ages of 5 and 12, which is, you know, kind of unprecedented. But the Congressional Black Caucus also has declared this a state of emergency, and Representative bon Bonnie Coleman has um, formed a task force with other members of Congress, and then subsequently formed a work group that is chaired, that's going to be chaired by Dr. Michael Lindsay, who's doing a lot of research around black children and suicide out of the uh, New York uh, University. Now, is it also, I mean, is it, do you believe also that there's more reporting? Or is, there, is, I mean, there, is, is, is there more reporting of, uh, because previously, they didn't even care what happened to black kids. Right. I think that, that that definitely plays a part in it, that there's more reporting, that there's more um, of a magnifying glass on what's going on, not just with suicide, but with homicide. Mm -hmm. And so the numbers are so staggering with regard to black uh, young people in general, but especially black males, that you, there is a lot of um, just people looking to see what's going on with our young children. I want to push back a little bit uh, when you talk about young males because mm -hmm. we there is significant evidence that young black women are also committing suicide at higher rates, that they're being bullied more, that all of the things that visit women, body image, et cetera, um, affect young black women. In addition to the fact that young black girls are not seen as girls as children. Right. They're seen as women when they're as young as five, six, seven years old. So what is the research showing about our girls and what can we do about our girls? You're right with regard to the bullying piece and the whole mean girl um, analogy is very real still and that um, when we look at the children um, the research does show that the young black males have a higher rate of incident than the young black females. 
And to what extent are we looking at adverse childhood experiences? So the ACEs scores for African-American kids are typically a lot higher than they are for any other demographic of young people, largely because of growing up in poverty, but in, in all the societal ills that come along with that, right. um, having a parent who's incarcerated, having lost friends and loved ones to gun and gang violence and all of those things help to, you know, push that ticker point up. Um, this is a very personal issue for me because I lost my brother at 12. He committed suicide. Mm -hmm. So when I think about what's going on with young people, particularly African-American boys, um, and how they are handling a lot of what's going on around them. My brother committed suicide four months after my mom died of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very real and very evident thing in my family, but also something that I see kids having to cope with across the country. Being someone who worked in education for a long time, um, when we think about suicide, when we think about mental health, it is not necessarily regarded in the same way in our community Absolutely. as it is in others in terms of seeking counseling, seeking help. Um, it is seen as a weakness for black people because we have that, you're supposed to be that strong black woman, you're supposed to be that strong black man, irrespective to so much of society tearing you down every day. Right. So I'm wondering um, within the research itself, how does that play out for you? Well, a couple things that you said. One thing is that there is still a lot of stigma around mental health and mental illness in the African American community. There is a lot of not talking about it. There are a lot of cultural norms where we as people tend to want to keep things in our home. You don't take this outside of your home. Um, there, bec and because of that, because we haven't talked about it, we haven't learned to talk about it, right? And so when now, I don't know who's at the age where they're uh, having children go to a pediatrician, but the pediatricians are now uh, making assessments and screenings, and they're asking um, these young children, have you ever thought of harming yourself? Do you feel safe in your home? Are you being bullied? So it's a whole list of screening that goes on now that wasn't going on, let's say, 10 years ago. Greg, final comment. Just be, you know, Jan, first of all, thank you for the work because, I mean, this is so important. Um, you know, our communities have never been safe outside of our communities. Wilma King's work on childhood during slavery. I mean, black child death is nothing new in America. But what, what can our communities do to perhaps put a floor under these children? Because 5 to 12, and I'm sorry to hear about your brother, I mean, this is absurd. Right. I mean, what, what, what are some of the things that you see on the ground as you're working in the community, Baltimore area or wherever in the country, right. where we can kind of stand between this society and our children and help them at this point? One of the things that we, was, we do a lot of work, like you say, in Baltimore, and we do a lot of work with parents, and we're trying to have them have the real conversations. So more than just the talk around what your child does if they encounter law enforcement, yes. but also the talk around what your child is doing when they're feeling a certain way, and being able to identify and name those feelings, and not just from you know, the traditional sheet where they show the smiley, the different faces, <laughs> but be able to have words that connect to their actual feelings and then have adults pay attention to the children. We are um, gone are the days where, you know, children are seen and not heard. Yes. We really need to step back and, and, and create a new paradigm around that. Uh, where should folks go to get more information if they are concerned about uh, their uh, child, niece, nephew, cousin? So um, the Black Mental Health Alliance's website is blackmentalhealth.com, or they can call our office at 410-338-2642. All right, Jan Peters, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank you important. all. It's so Thank important. You. All right, uh, today marks the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Of course, that was in the Allied invasion of Normandy. More than 9,000 Allied soldiers were killed or wounded, but their sacrifice allowed more than 100,000 soldiers to defeat Adolf Hitler in Germany. And of course, mainstream media, they've been covering this story all week. Donald Trump is overseas along with many other uh, American leaders. But you have not seen lots of attention focused on the role that black soldiers played in that battle. Joining me right now is retired Army General Kip Ward and also the author of the book, The Forgotten, uh, Linda Herview. That particular book is, uh, is, a, is about, of course, black soldiers and um, World War uh, and uh, D-Day. And before we go to them, hear the words of some of the soldiers who actually served.
My name is William Garfield Abney. I was with the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. My name is Arthur Guest, 3451-9688. The one reason I ain't had no reason to go fighting because the, um, the, the American wasn't, wasn't that good a place to fight for. Not for a black man. We was all trained to handle these balloons. You would send those balloons up on the cable and that lit it up and bring it in. It was something like a canister bum and it would pull the bum right down into the wing of the plane and boom, the plane would blow up. We, we certainly thank uh, all uh, soldiers uh, who served in the United States military uh, for their sacrifice uh, in all of our wars, including World War II, but we specifically wanted to focus on these black soldiers. Uh, Kip Ward, you're one of the very few uh, African Americans to ever attain the rank of four-star general in the United States Army, and when you think about what these brothers went through, and these were brothers who went, who went through this at that particular time, they were fighting on two battlefields. They were fighting for America against Hitler and were fighting against America because of racism at the same time. You know, Roland, absolutely. First of all, uh, good to be with you again. And, uh, you know, those men and in some cases women who served during uh, all of our nation's wars, as you've indicated, uh, had uh, many reasons for serving. Uh, clearly, one of those predominant reasons was maybe by doing what they did to show America that they, too, were men, women, worthy of everything that this country had to offer by going to bat into battle, they could achieve those freedoms here at home. Certainly, as we know, wasn't always the case. But and, and Kip, uh, and when I was, again, so for, I love people on social media because uh, uh, we operated in real time. So when I said the men, there were no women who were on the beach in Normandy that particular day. So I was specific to that because that's what we're dealing with. We talk about what black folks went through. We talk about um, again, here you are wearing a patch uh, we, representing the United States, saying, uh, pledging allegiance uh, to fight for your country, knowing full well that when you go back home, uh, you are going to have to encounter a, a different conversation. And uh, over, the, over history, uh, the, the, role, the, the role that these black soldiers played on D-Day uh, often not talked about. They certainly understood that going back, coming back home, knowing that what they fought for abroad wasn't going to be available to them at home. But just as today, you know, the hope for a better tomorrow was a motivation for many of them. But by serving, maybe things would change for not necessarily them, but for those who would come behind them. And so their courage demonstrated in so many ways valiantly because they fought selflessly and fully knowing that what may be available for them wouldn't be there. But maybe by doing what they did, it would be something that those who would come behind them, other black Americans could, in fact, have to for them themselves. Can you share with us um, uh, in your time in the Army uh, that you crossed paths with any of uh, those soldiers who fought on D-Day, those black soldiers? Uh, as you pointed out, uh, we're, we're no women to be sure, and only about 2,000. Unfortunately, many of them have gone on. Uh, I did meet one who has now passed on uh, who was in the anti-aircraft uh, balloon barrage battery. Now, that was a group of men who were on that initial assault there. That the, it was the uh, 320th anti-aircraft uh, barrage battalion. And uh, so I met one of those gentlemen uh, 
in fact, during the 60th anniversary of D-Day, when I was the Deputy Commander General of the United States Army Europe, uh, and I was over there in charge of the European part of the commemoration, and he was, in fact, present uh, th then that time. I believe there's only one of those men still living today. Um, when we think about, again, um, this history, when we think about um, black soldiers, I remember when Bill O'Reilly had the audacity to question uh, Colin Kaepernick saying he needed to read his book uh, about um, uh, World War II to understand uh, patriotism, and I chose to actually read off a litany of books that uh, Bill needed to read to understand uh, black patriotism. To me, there is no greater patriotism to fight for a country that didn't love you. Absolutely. I mean, that, as I said, you, this was the height of selflessness in doing something for a country that didn't return it, but with the hopes that over time, other black Americans would be able to take advantage of the rights, privileges that this country proposes as its ideal. Um, last question for you, Kip. Um, what would you say to somebody right now why they should join the U.S. Army? Why should they, they should join the U.S. military? There are multiple reasons. There is no single reason why anyone would serve. And as I talk to young today who are currently serving, they're serving for a multiplicity of reasons, for better gain, something for educational benefits, for love of country. These men and women serve today for reasons that are personal, that are societal, wanting to give back in some cases, wanting to better themselves in other cases, for the love of country and some of those same cases. And so there is no single reason why young black men and women serve for a multitude of reasons. And thankfully they do continue to serve because it is in fact that service that over time I think is important that this nation will ultimately come to understand, acknowledge and have huge respect for. It's there in some degree, clearly more to go. All right, then. Uh, General Kip Ward, always good talking to you, man. Say hello to the wife. I shall. We'll do that for sure. Thanks uh, very much. I Roy. appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. And, folks, just some histor history. Uh, Kip Ward, he was the first uh, com commander of AFRICOM. Uh, that was the fifth uh, command that was created uh, under President George W. Bush. And he was the first uh, commander of AFRICOM and, again, had achieved the rank of four-star general. Also, um, we uh, were, were scheduled to have um, Linda uh, Herview on the show. Uh, guys, she put the cover of her book up so I can let folks know. Uh, and that if you don't have it, just go to my iPad. Uh, the book is called, the book is called uh, Forgotten. The untold story of D-Day's black heroes at home and at war uh, by, I don't uh, guys, can y'all fix this? I don't know why you're not being able to see it. So uh, fix that, please, because I'm showing it's connected right here. Uh, and so, and, and this, is imp this is important. Uh, I'm going to go out panel real quick. This, this is important because, again, when I went off on, 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 on Bill O'Reilly, unfortunately, a lot of people who have no idea about our impact in the military. There was a campaign called Grade, the Double V campaign that was going on at the same time, that launched by the Pittsburgh Courier, picked up by the Chicago Defender and others. It started in World War I, victory at home and victory abroad. Yeah, that's right, because of the lessons we learned in World War I. Uh, uh, black folks have fought in the American Revolution as many blacks fought for the British as fought for the, uh, for the Americans, because we didn't care who won. We were trying to get free. I appreciate what that elder said. He said, you know, I don't know if I had really a reason to fight. My father and three of his brothers, three of the four men in, in his side of the family were drafted into World War II. Uh, my, my uncle Virgil fought for the Red Ball Express. Those were the brothers they sent out to refuel the tanks. If a German sniper hit that thing, they went up in flames. Emmett Till's father was executed by the United States military. He's buried in a segregated cemetery in France, and that ring that was on his finger at the time, that's how they identified his son's body in Mississippi, because he was convicted of the crime of sleeping so, with white women. So, so it's all the paradox. Julian, Julian, hold on, hold on, great finish. No, the reason I'm just saying this is that the book's like forgotten. Another book called Liberators. We talked about uh, Sister Leah Chase Love and Patton. General Patton, the 761st Tank Battalion, those were some of the first brothers who went in and broke into Auschwitz and the German con to the concentration camp for the Jews. We are all up in this history, and finally, as you said, double V, and you've talked about this many times, victory here, meaning what, we ain't going to have a world to fight white supremacists and come back here and get lynched. That triggered the civil rights movement when those soldiers came back. Julian, hold on one second. Go to my iPad, please. I want to show you that uh, the book is called Patton's Panthers, mm. of the African-American 761st Tank yes, Battalion sir. in World War II by Charles Sasser. 
So I wrote a book after um, September 11th called The Paradox of Loyalty. Yes. The subtitle was The African American Response to the War on Terrorism. It really looked at that paradox of us fighting for the right to fight. Black people fought for the right to fight, um, to be considered Americans, even as we were not considered Americans. Black men marched down 125th Street in Harlem in 1919, yeah. saying, we are veterans, we want to be respected. And those veterans, many of them, were lynched in uniform, lynched in uniform because they dared step up and say, we have the right to our American privileges. And so while I definitely respect our elder, who was quite eloquent, I think that we also, as we heard the orange man talking on D-Day, um, I didn't listen to it, but go ahead. Well, I listened to a little bit of it. None of it. Because I'm an insomniac, so I whatever. I listened to none of it. He's talked about, can we all be united? No, Maryland farmer, we cannot be united <laughs> when you basically disunite us. Fake bone and spurs. the fact is that we have never looked at the contributions of black people to this country. And I would just lift up the name of mm -hmm. Dr. Um, Olivia Hooker, who was uh, in the Coast Guard the survive, last survivor of Tulsa, who fought to be, she wanted to be a Navy woman, they wouldn't accept her, she went to the Coast Guard. Our people, many of our people, not me, but many of our people are so patriotic that we will fight for the right to be American, and America continues to reject us. Amisha, go ahead. That was going to be something I touched on. I think that having our patriotism questioned as black people because we want to protest, because we want to exercise our constitutional rights, because we want to be able to walk down the street and not be accosted, that's a problem. Because we've had African Americans serve in every major military advancement yes. that this country has ever known. We have served as spies, we have served valiantly and died on the front lines, and not been respected coming back. Our families have been left to perish. And to fight for a country and to preserve that, to have the idea full-fledged to believe in democracy, even when you don't ever see it fulfilled at home, I think that has to be something that America takes into consideration. Working in a news station today, there was nonstop coverage of D-Day, period. Mm -hmm. Did not see one single contribution of an African-American. And nor, African nor make the distinction mm -hmm. Uh, that not all soldiers were equal during D-Day. All right, folks, uh, a little bit later at the end of the show, uh, I'm going to actually uh, play for y'all that, that commentary I did, uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh, <laughs> more than 7 million views on Facebook, about 300,000 on YouTube. And so if y'all missed that, uh, so I'm, let me warn you in advance. Okay, first of all, it's on YouTube. Uh, I spit a bunch of books. So mm -hmm. don't be sending me an email saying, roll up all the books, you night. It's right there. All <laughs> of them, the picture, name, author, you got it. It's all there, and so uh, we're going to go to a break right now. We'll be back at Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. rollermartinunfiltered.com. Hey guys, they're back. MarijuanaStock.org has another great investment opportunity. If you were lucky enough uh, to invest in their last crowdfunding campaign, you know they raised a lot of money in just a few months investing in legal marijuana farms. Now, those initial investors now own shares of a publicly traded company. Folks, the last time, again, a lot of y'all missed it. Y'all were emailing me. Oh, what about it? Well, guess what? Now they have a new investment opportunity that is, is as good, if not even better, than last. I'm talking about industrial hemp CBD. Now, for those who don't know, the hemp plant is the cousin to marijuana with a much higher concentration of CBD, which means hemp CBD gives you all of the benefits of marijuana without getting you high. Until recently, hemp farming was practically illegal in the U.S. and heavily regulated by the DEA. However, the 2018 Farm Bill changed all of that, uh, making it legal to grow hemp CBD in the U.S. and creating one of the largest commodities worldwide. They need land to grow all of the plants. This makes for an incredible investment opportunity, and that's where our good friends at 420 Real Estate come in. Now, first of all, they're black. I'm saying that because a lot of African-Americans are not in. Now, we, we were hurt by marijuana laws 
and now white folks are benefiting financially from the change to those very laws. Well, uh, the business model of 420 Real Estate is simple. They buy land that supports hemp CBD grow operations and lease it to licensed, high-paying tenants. That's right, they are hemp CBD landlords. And you can get in on the action. You can invest in this crowdfunding campaign for as little as $200 up to $10,000. Like I said, I'm not missing out on this, and neither should you. You should, you should invest. Go to MarijuanaStock.org, MarijuanaStock.org. You can get in the game and get in the game now. Also, a programming note, tomorrow uh, on the show, uh, we're going to have uh, some sisters uh, here in the studio uh, talking about marijuana because uh, in D.C. Uh, this uh, weekend, they actually have, let me find it right here, you can go to wgsummit.com, wgsummit.com. Uh, it is called the 2019 Women Grow Leadership Summit, uh, and it's black women who are disrupting the cannabis industry. Uh, and so they're meeting in D.C. Uh, tomorrow and Saturday. Uh, and so we're going to have uh, the president and CEO uh, on the show tomorrow to talk about that. All right, folks, uh, let me give you some word about Linda Farrestein. You know, she was the prosecutor who put away uh, the Central Park Five. She was, she's made a ton of money writing books. Well, guess what? Uh, she had to resign earlier this week from Vassar College as well as another uh, group there in New York. Now she's been stripped of Glamour Magazine's Woman of the Year Award, which she got in 1993. They now admit that they were wrong. This all comes on the heels of Ava DuVernay's uh, drama series on Netflix called When They See Us, the petition to call for her to lose her book publishing deals and for Amazon to remove her books uh, has now surpassed uh, 25,000 and maybe as high as 50,000. I'm gonna double check in a minute, it's on change.org. And so we certainly shall see what happens, but uh, she should lose everything. Everything. Everything, no speeches, no books, no wars, nothing, because she is still walking around saying that those five committed the act, and we know that's a doggone lie. All right, crazy white people, y'all know what that means. <laughs> No charcoal grills are allowed. I'm white. I got you, Carl. Uh, um, illegally selling water without a permit? On my property. Whoa! Hey! Hey, Grandpa, get away! You don't live here. I'm uncomfortable. Lord have mercy. A Texas teacher was fired after asking Donald Trump on Twitter to remove the illegals from her school. Georgia Clark of Fort Worth admitted she wrote those tweets but she thought she was sending a DM. Here's why her dumb ass should have gotten fired, because if you don't know the difference between a direct message and a public <laughs> post, you shouldn't be teaching anybody. In fact, you should have your students teaching you what's going on. <laughs> the Fort Worth Independent School District voted unanimously to fire her because of her comments. She also had made some other comments before where she was criticizing um, Latino students there as well. 63% of the school district, y'all, in Fort Worth, is Latino. My God. Girlfriend is cray cray. Not only, I mean, I don't understand, like you said, what do you call it, Roland? The crazy, crazy white ass white people. I, I don't understand how somebody who is a teacher actually targets her students yes. publicly and then sends a message to the orange man as if, I mean, it would be hilarious if it was not so dis distasteful. And we should, oh, I, I thought I was seeing the DM. I was going to say, like, that doesn't help matters. We, we right. talk about training people against implicit bias. She is extremely explicit in her bias and thinks it's okay if she says these messages privately. But I will also say that, you know, coming from a president who has thrown down when it comes to immigrants, who has made it very clear that he despises those of Latino descent, she thought that she was at home she and on friendly dog, ground. He sent a dog whistle. She responded to the dog whistle. But the Frankly, it does not hold water in Fort Worth, Texas, where 63% of the young people are Latino. Well, uh, you can't do that. I don't disagree. I, mean, I am concerned a little bit about this First Amendment issue uh, because we can all agree when you see a white supremacist or a white nationalist. The question will become when they turn that lens on one or more of us. What happens to the black woman, for example, who says something in a classroom or that is clearly provable by facts that says about World War II or something, and somebody doesn't like it? Next thing you know, they want to get rid of her for something she said. Say, well, no, no, but you're looking at case now. Speech is a precedent. I mean, I'm with you on this Linda Fairstein thing. I mean, you know, she should lose everything. But the question becomes, what happens when Amazon removes her books 
Right. And then turns around and removes and uh, remove Farrakhan or Jeremiah Wright or no, your mine. books, right? You know. And then, uh, so I, I don't know where we're headed, but I'm just concerned because white supremacy never does anything without a plan after the it. first thing they've done, and that's the thing I'm well, looking at. Well, the first right? piece, Greg, is really important. Uh, Dr. Carr is really important no. for us to understand the First Amendment piece, but the other piece of it is the whole notion of what's happening to our nation and the fact that we are more diverse oh. and that people have to be not tolerant. Not tolerant, but accepting exactly. of the diversity that we're experiencing. Well, speaking of diversity, mm -hmm. folks, they're lighting up uh, Jeffrey Goldberg. He's the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic Magazine. Why? Because he made uh, some comments that dealt with the issue of diversity in journalism. He says that pretty much the people who can write long-form pieces, 10,000-word pieces, exclusively white men. This is a quote. It's really, really hard to write a 10,000 word cover story. There are not a lot of journalists in America who can do it. The journalists in America who do it are almost exclusively white males. Now, some have said that he was trying to make the point that they are trying to fix that. Uh, but in fact, I want to pull something, let me pull this story up because he actually said something else that I thought was interesting, which is really going to be the focus of my commentary on this, because y'all know uh, I have no problem at all uh, sitting here uh, jacking these folks up because of what they do. And, and you have to and, and, and remember, y'all, I am in the business of words. I listen to what people have to say and I, I, I go through the whole deal. And so uh, this is actually what he said. We continue to have a and actually it was a column he wrote. It was a column he wrote. Uh, where he took questions uh, from folks, um, uh, their audience. He said, we continue to have a problem with the print magazine cover stories, with the gender and race issues when it comes to cover story writing. Of the 15 print issues The Atlantic has published since January 2018, 11 had cover stories written by men. Quote, it's really, really hard to write a 10,000 word cover story. There are not a lot of journalists in America who do it. The, the journalists in America who do it are almost exclusively white males. What I have to do and I haven't done this enough yet, is again about experience versus potential. You can look at people and be like, well, your experience is writing 1,200 word pieces for the web and you're great at it, so good going. Now let me unpack that. <laughs> Here's the fun. Now, again, you're looking at somebody who is vice president digital for the National Association of Black Journalists, lifetime member, third time being on the board of directors, previously, previously secretary, before that, the national student representative. You're talking about somebody who went to a communications high school in Houston. So essentially, I've been doing journalism since I was 14 years old. That is the last 36 and a half years. What I have experienced in 36 and a half years in this industry has been white supremacy hmm. meaning if you truly look at that statement what he is saying that hmm, the people who really can write long 10,000 word pieces hmm, they're white men y'all that's white supremacy meaning you think you're better and let's unpack that the reason he's saying that is because if you look at the magazine industry all across the board who do you largely see white I folks can. When Spike Lee did uh, one of his previous movies, he said, I will not do any magazine interviews unless you send a black journalist. Oh, white folks lost their mind, but it forced them to look at their newsrooms. They looked up and went, damn, we don't have anybody to send because they didn't even acknowledge that it was an all white newsroom. This is the equivalent of saying, you know what? It'd be great for an African-American to be the CEO of a company. But you know what? Those with the experience to run companies are simply white men. But see, what bothers me is when he talked about this whole issue of, ex when he said, experience versus potential. See, if you are a real editor and you want to fix this problem, and then you have individuals who work at your place who are black, and they've written 1,200 word articles, do you know what you do the next time? You assign them a 4,000 word article. And then when they do a 4,000 word article, you assign them a seven or 8,000 word article. And then when they've done that, you assign them a 10,000 word article. Actually, it's not hard. I've run three black newspapers. Every paper I've run, there were some people who were excellent, who were top of the line. But I always knew I couldn't solely depend upon them because I might need somebody else to write a cover story one day. 
And so I had to look into the newsroom to say, okay, was well, your skill set, your skill set, and your skill set. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a shot to do this here. Let me explain to you what we do here at Roller Martin Unfiltered. My control room is right there. Henry directs the show. Stephanie is sitting next to him. She's a producer. I said, Henry, I need Stephanie cross-trained uh, to actually direct the show. Chelsea, who sits over here, who also is an associate producer, she's had to learn how to use the robotic cameras. Atlanta is my niece, who runs uh, tapes. She also had to learn how to use robotic cameras. You know why that's the case? I need everybody to be cross-trained. Every person who works here is going to have to learn to use a Canon XA25, how to use that camera, the Canon XF405 4K camera, how to use it. Why? Because that's what leaders do, Jeffrey. They train <laughs> up. They coach up. Hmm. And if you're serious about this, hmm. that's exactly what you should do. Hmm. And stop making excuses. There are black folks who now write for The Atlantic. Yeah. Adam Sir. Yeah. Jamel Hill. And others. Adam Harris. Are you trying to say to me right. they don't have the ability to write 10,000 word stories? Right. It is because white men who are in power are comfortable assigning stories to other Shut white up. men to doing the exact same coverage. It is no different than when you see these, these folks who are the ones leading the conversations in politics are largely white men. I have been at the table with two presidents where they've had the television anchors in the room. And I can tell you, in one of those meetings, before Lester Holt became the NBC Nightly News anchor, who was the only black per person sitting in the room? Yours truly. When Lester got the job, guess what? We were there under Trump when he invited some people. Yamish Alcindor, who's not a television anchor, was there with, for PBS. It was Lester, me, and Yamish. I brought Derek McGinty along because I had an open spot. They had two for us. <laughs> Why am I saying that? It's because what black people have always said is, yo, when the hell are we going to get a shot? It's the same thing. If you keep pursuing white supremacy, by trying to use experience as the reason why we can't find anybody, that's why you'll never find anybody. Because as long as you say if 11 men wrote cover stories, you're going to have more men writing because you never actually make the effort. And here's the other piece. If you got somebody who isn't seriously experienced, but they have enough experience, that's why you have good-ass editors to edit their pieces. Y'all. I keep telling y'all, and I need y'all to hear me, why this is the last bastion. This, media. Why? Because media is America's greatest export. The world knows us because of our movies, because of our television shows, because of our, because of our newscasts, because of our music. That is what is exported to the world. People learn about America through what they see and hear on the big screen, small screen, now when it comes to digital media, and also when it comes uh, to music as well. And so, when Hollywood says, oh, we can't take that black film and they don't do well overseas, they do, you're actually promoting the same nonsense. Because when you say that, that means we're not gonna put a black person in the film here because it can't, can't take it overseas, so therefore we can't sell it, so the black person never gets to be the lead. Mm. Mm. So y'all understand how this whole thing goes? Mm. This is the game. I keep trying to explain to y'all that. And see, what I also keep trying to explain to y'all, why it's important, why you gotta have shows like this and black people running it, because I can do a roll call right now mm. of the black people who have come through my shows, Washington Watch, News One Now, and Roland Martin Unfiltered, who when you turn on cable news, all of a sudden you see them. Paul Butler at MSNBC, hmm. Angela Rye at CNN, Sir Michael Singleton, when you see, when you saw Paris Denard, when you see David Swerdlick, Lauren Coates, when you saw her on Hardball, she was a, she was on a panel on Hardball. Whose show does she host? Mine. Hosting ain't the same as a panel. You know what that's called? Opportunity. I saw Lauren said, hmm, I think she has host potential. Put her in the chair. Now she has her own show on Sirius XM. But CNN, y'all ain't seen CNN put her in the host chair. <laughs> but she can. And guess who says she should host Jeopardy one day after he retires? 
Alex Trebek. What, what did Alex Trebek see in Lauren Coates that nobody else saw? But CNN won't put her in the host chair. Do y'all see where I'm going? Jeffrey Goldberg, do you see where I'm going? If somebody who's in power doesn't decide to change the paradigm and begin to break this whole deal open, then it doesn't change. That's the only reason we support Branch Rickey. Jackie Robinson could always play ball. That's right. Jackie Robinson played ball in the Negro Leagues. By the way, he wasn't the best in the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. So it was no shock he succeeded in Major League Baseball because, hell, we knew he could play. Somebody just simply had to open the damn door, as James Brown said, just open the door and I get, get it myself. myself. The reality is, Jeffrey Goldberg, don't sit here and whine and complain about, oh my goodness, these all these just men. No, have the guts. No, have the balls <laughs> to actually say, I am going to assign a woman the cover story. I'm going to assign an African-American the cover story. And if anybody in the room has a problem with it, then take it up with me because that's why it says editor-in-chief. Jeffrey, I've run three black newspapers and I had total control. I ran blackamericaweb.com. I had total control. I was the host and managing editor of News One Now. I'm the host and managing editor of this show and I'm the owner. And guess what? I run it. My suggestion to you Learn how to be a damn leader and change the game. Poop or get off the pot. Poop. All right, y'all. I want to thank our panel for being here. Amisha, thanks a bunch. Greg Carr. Of course, Dr. Julian Malvo as well. Uh, if you want to support Roller Martin on the filter, y'all take the music out. I'm going to play the, I'm going to play the Bill O'Reilly uh, uh, commentary. You want, to, you want to support Roller Martin on the filter, go to rollermartinonthefilter.com. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Don't forget, every dollar goes to support this show. Uh, as I said to y'all, um, again, today is the 75th, 75th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, and uh, it's important for us to acknowledge African Americans and our contributions. So... When I was at, at News One Now on TV One, Bill O'Reilly had something to say about Colin Kaepernick and patriotism. Then I had something to say to Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> y'all get to enjoy this. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Speaking of not caring about black people, Bill O'Reilly. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Folks, the Fox News host the other night, two nights ago, he tried to chastise Colin Kaepernick. Hey, he's written some book, and then he decides to go on his show, actually won the Today Show earlier, then he goes on his book, and he said this about the San Francisco 49er quarterback who's been protesting uh, by kneeling to the national anthem for the purpose of bringing attention to police brutality. So here's my message to Mr. Kaepernick and his sympathizers. No nation is perfect, but American police officers very rarely shoot civilians. The statistics prove it. Also, while there is social injustice and blacks have suffered in this country, most Americans deplore bias and we have seen tremendous improvements in that area. To overhype the few police shootings that do occur and to create hostility toward your own country should be put in a basket of deplorables. Perspective is everything in life. Now, I am going to send Kaepernick a copy of Killing the Rising Sun. I am not confident he will read it. But if he does, he might understand that millions of Americans have given their lives for the cause of freedom. Freedom for blacks in the Civil War. Freedom for everybody in the Revolutionary War. Freedom for Asians and freedom for Europe in World War II and World War I. I do not respect Colin Kaepernick's actions. I think he is wrong in the extreme. And I think his frame of reference about his own country is scant. S-C-A-N-T. And I think that is stupid. S-T-U-P-I-D. Here's the reality. Did Bill O'Reilly just say that millions of Americans gave their lives for the freedom of black folks in the American Revolution? Last I check, black folks were not free during the American Revolution. In fact, last I check, many black folks who first came to this country in 1619 fought for the British in order to gain their freedom. That's a historical fact. Bill, what books are you reading? Because last I check, 1776, America founded. Uh, Emancipation Proclamation did not come on until 1863. Uh, almost 100 years later, Bill. So exactly... 
what black folks were freed during the American Revolution. Oh, then Bill, of course, cited the Civil War, and again, uh, somehow believing that, oh no, they were fighting for the freedom of black people. Really? So please explain to me the, the Great Compromise of 1877 that entered the period of Reconstruction after 12 years that ushered in Jim Crow. You know that deal that was cut where Republican Rutherford B. Hayes became president, and Democrats said you gotta pull the federal troops out of the South? See, that's the same history, Bill. So please explain to me again how black folks were freed, because if black folks were freed with the Civil War, then that means we would not have had Jim Crow. I mean, we would not have had to go through the Civil Rights Movement. But then, of course, you then have the audacity, the unmitigated gall, to actually say that, oh, it was also about freeing black people during World War II. But please explain to me how many black soldiers came back to America and they still had racial hatred. Explain to me the black soldiers who were forced to ride in the back of rail cars when the German POWs were allowed to ride in front of them because of racism in America. See, Bill, you want Colin Kaepernick to read your book about patriotism and real patriotism. No, Bill O'Reilly, the real patriotism is when you're black in America and you fought for a nation even though that nation did not fight for you. That's real patriotism. So imagine those African Americans who fought in the Civil War knowing full well they were not fully free. Imagine the African Americans who fought in World War I and World War II and in the Korean War and the Vietnam War knowing full well that America was not willing to see them as free. That's actual history. So Bill O'Reilly, damn your book. Colin Kaepernick should not read your book because your book is a joke when it comes to patriotism. So book, Bill, I got some books for you to read because it's clearly what you have been reading is absolutely nonsensical. So Bill, here's the first one. Bloods, Black Veterans of the Vietnam War, an old history by Wallace Terry. You might want to read that book to get the sense what it was like for black soldiers facing bigotry in Vietnam, supposedly fighting against communism when they're still fighting for freedom in America. How about this book, Bill? I Never Had It Made, an autobiography of Jackie Robinson by Jackie Robinson. If you read that book, Bill, you know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out that it was Jackie Robinson who also said in that very book, why he did not salute the flag, why he did not uh, uh, stand for the national anthem because he said America has never seen me as truly an American. That's what Jackie Robinson said. By the way, Bill, he was a veteran, served in the Army, but also we had to go through a court-martial in Texas when he chose not to ride at the back of the bus. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought that black folks were freed in the American Revolution and the previous wars, so why did he have to ride at the back of the bus in El Paso, Texas. Let's go to the next book, Bill. Patton's Panthers, the African-American 761st Tank Battalion in World War II by Charles Sasser. That details those brothers uh, who were sitting here uh, fighting alongside Patton. Here's another book for you, Bill. American Patriots, the story of blacks in the military from the revolution to Desert Storm by Gail Lumet Buckley. Yes, right, black folks, actual American patriots. Here's another book, Bill, Strength for the Fight, a history of black Americans in the military by Bernard C. Nolte. Something else you should read. But how about this one? Benjamin O. Davis Jr., American, an autobiography, a black man who he went to West Point and they did not speak to him for an entire year while he was at West Point. See, Bill, I thought we were all Americans. I thought we were all free. But you mentioned World War II, which your new book is about. So why don't you read this book called The Double V Campaign, African Americans in World War II by Michael L. Cooper. See, here's what you don't realize, Bill. The Double V campaign was about fighting for victory abroad and victory at home. It was Robert Abbott, the founder of the Chicago Defender, who also started this when he founded the paper. They picked it up when John Sinstack became publisher of the Chicago Defender. You might want to read Evan McKaylee's book on the Defender, uh, a black paper that changed America, because it was black newspapers who challenged America by saying, hey, how can we fight against uh, the Nazis? How can we fight against fascism? But we somehow... We have racism in America. Bill, you might then learn with the Double B campaign. There was J. Edgar Hoover and the federal government who tried to put those black publishers uh, in jail because they dared to write about the racism that was happening on military bases in America. Oh, I'm sorry. You ran up against a black man who can actually read. How about this book, Bill O'Reilly? The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Orders of the United States by Gerald Horn. In that particular book, you read of those, African, those Africans of descent who 
Hood chose to fight for the British because the British promised them their freedom. But Gerald Horn also makes the argument in his book, Bill O'Reilly, that the reason for the American Revolution was because the 13 colonies feared the British were going to outlaw slavery abolish slavery, which was their only income in the United States. Because, see, Bill, it was slavery. It was picking cotton that created capitalism in America, it allowed America to become uh, the greatest of uh, a nation when it came financially, not the Industrial Revolution, but it was picking cotton. But I got another book for you, Bill, on the altar of freedom of black soldiers' Civil War letters from the front by James Henry Gooding. See, that's another book. I got one more for you, Bill. Buffalo Soldiers, the Colored Regulars in the United States Army by T.G. Stewart. Also another book, Bill, The Marines of Montford Point, America's First Black Marines by Melton McLaurin. If you can read, Bill, they got an audio book so you can actually listen to them. You actually hear the stories of black soldiers talking about what was a, what was it like to have a uniform on, to have an American flag on their shoulder, but still face racism in the military. I dare say there has been no person who has been a true American patriot than an African American who who has been willing to fight for this nation when well, the nation would not fight for him and her. That bill is American history. That's the history that Colin Kaepernick is talking about. And so if you want somebody to read your book, why don't you actually read what it's like to be a real patriot? So Colin Kaepernick, if he sends you your book, his book, throw it in the trash and then send him an Amazon gift card to go buy some other books so he can learn what it's like to be black in America, what it's learn how to fight for America, what it's learn to be when you're mega ever and you fought for America, but you had to come back in your uniform. Bill, read about those black soldiers who came back from World War II, who were lynched in their uniforms, who were shot in their uniforms. They fought for America, but America then turned around and killed them. Bill, school is now over. It's time for you to go do some damn homework. Kickstart your day at 7 and get the news you need from the perspective you want. News One Now with Roland Martin, every weekday morning at 7 on TV One. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play. Martin. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. As Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.
but I think that collectively Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. And check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play. Martin. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Martin. Thank you.